Now we'll look at the next case law, that is the, the Natco Bayer compulsory license issue. This was a landmark case in India as it was the first compulsory license granted. It was granted over Bayer's patented drug, Nixavar. In August 2011, Natco, an Indian generic company, applied for the grant of a compulsory license for the anti-cancer drug, Nexaver. In March, On March 9, 2012, the Indian Patent Office granted the first post-TRIPS compulsory license in respect of this drug. This drug was used for treating kidney and liver cancer. The Indian Patent Office granted the license to the Natco Pharmaceuticals, enabling it to produce and sell the drug domestically on condition of payment of royalty at 6% quarterly royalty of net sales. The Indian Patent Office held that all three grounds mentioned in Section 84 had been met, namely that the reasonable requirements of the public were not met as Bayer supplied the drug to only 2% of the patient population of about 8,800 that required it. Secondly, the drug priced at Rs. 2,80,000 for just a month's supply was not reasonably affordable. It's uh, relevant to note that Natco was willing to supply the same at Rs. 8,800 per month. And thirdly, the patent was not worked in the territory of India, as Bayer did not manufacture the drug in India, but merely imported it. Bayer took this in appeal to India's specialized IP tribunal, the IPAB, and on March 14, 2013, the IPAB upheld the license and confirmed all three grounds mentioned in the order of the patent controller, though there were some differences in how the decisions were reached. Notably, the IPAB also held that even though the grounds in Section 84 were separate and individually sufficient as causes for the grant of a compulsory license, the grounds were linked such that the failure of one ground would likely trigger another ground. Looking into the reasonable requirements test, the IPAB considered the following factors when making their decision the need for the drug in terms of patient pool, the volume of the drug supplied by Bayer to the market, with both its patient assistance program as well as without the program, the effect of the price on the availability of the drug to the public. The IPAB found that the price of Rs 2.8 lakhs per month was prohibitively expensive, especially in contrast to Natco's price of 8,800 per month. Then they looked into whether Bayer's patient assistance program could be considered as contributing to Bayer's standard for working and found that only commercial use was relevant to whether the reasonable requirements of the public were being met, as subsidy programs being voluntarily, voluntary and insufficient were unable to meet this requirement. The volume of imports by Bayer and found that the volume was sufficient to meet only 2% of the needs of patients. And finally, whether local manufacture was required to be considered working of the patent. And the IPB held that even if only imports were considered, the volume still did not meet the requirement of the public anyway. Thus, on considering all the above factors, and on finding that the insufficient numbers and prohibitively expensive product held that the that Bayer was not satisfying the reasonable requirements of the public for the drug. The IPO, the Indian Patent Office and the IPAB both held that determination of whether a price was re reasonably affordable to the general public does not hinge on the research and development and other related costs of the drug, but rather whether the drug is reasonably affordable from the consumer's perspective. Further, the controller and the IPAB also held a reasonably affordable price strongly correlates to whether or not the reasonable requirements of the public are being met. Notably, the IPAB also mentioned that a company facing a compulsory license grant on this ground could escape this provision by revisiting their pricing. As for royalty rates, IPAB held that Natco was required to increase the royalty payment from 6% to 7%. 
the main point of differentiation between the IPO and the IPAB was whether work in the territory of India could include imported products as well. The patent office held that mere imports could not amount to working, while the IPAB held that working requirement doesn't necessarily exclude imports, and therefore that mere imports could satisfy the working requirement, and that this, this needed to be decided on a case-to-case -case basis. With this, we end the abuse of patent type of compulsory license, and we move on to the public interest requirements based compulsory license. Section 92 allows the government to issue a notification in the official gazette that a compulsory license should be granted in respect of any patent. In cases of national emergency or extreme urgency or public non-commercial use. Following this notification, any interested party can apply and be granted a license on terms and conditions as the controller sees fit. Further, the controller is to ensure that the products manufactured under this license are made available at the lowest possible price with the patentees deriving a reasonable advantage from their patent rights. These are broadly considered the public interest grounds. However, there is yet to be an explanation or clarification as to the extent of these terms. The section does specify though that included in these criteria specifically are public health crises related to acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, that is AIDS, HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, tuberculosis, malaria, or other epidemics. It is not necessarily limited to these, but it definitely includes these. As of the writing of this module, the government is considering a section 2 not notification for three drugs. Moving on, aside from abuse of patent reasons and public interest requirement reasons, there are also two more types of compulsory licenses under our legislation. These include the compulsory license for export of pharmaceutical products and compulsory license of mailbox application related products. First, we'll deal with for, uh, compulsory licenses for export of pharmaceutical products. Section 92A was introduced in the 2005 amendment so as to implement the Doha Para 6 decision, provided, provided that a country with insufficient or no manufacturing capacity has issued a compulsory license over a patented pharmaceutical product. This provision makes a compulsory license available for the manufacture and export of such patented pharmaceutical products. When the controller receives such an application, the controller is to grant the compulsory license solely for the manufacture and export of such patented products under terms and conditions as specified by him. It is to be noted that this section is limited to pharmaceutical products which are needed to address public health problems including necessary ingredients and diagnostic kits. This provision has only come up once so far in the Indian context. In 2008, when Natco, a leading Indian generic manufacturer, applied for a compulsory license under Section 92A to export two patented drugs to Nepal. Natco submitted that Nepal was facing a public health crisis and lacked the manufacturing capacity to produce the required anti-lung cancer drug. However, on a hearing granted to the patent holders, which were Roche and Pfizer, the patent office noted that Nepal had not issued any relevant public health crisis drug requirements. Natco soon withdrew its offer after its application after this. The next type of compulsory license finds its application even more limited. This is the compulsory license of mailbox application related patents. Section 11A7 states that a patent after a patent is granted in respect of an application made under the mailbox system, the patent holder shall be only entitled to receive a reasonable royalty from such enterprises which have made significant investment and were producing and marketing the concerned products prior to January 2005 and which continue to manufacture the products covered by the patent on the date of grant of the patent and no infringement proceedings should be instituted against such enterprises. This means that generic manufacturers who are producing drugs in relation to which patent applications are or were pending by way of the mailbox system can continue such manufacture 
with the grant of a patent to the applicant without being sued for infringement. The onus of negotiating reasonable royalties lies on the patentee. Thus, in the much discussed Novartis v. Uni of India case, even if the court had upheld Novartis's patent, Cipla would be able to continue manufacture of imatinib, provided it paid reasonable royalties to Novartis. The question of what com- constitutes reasonable royalty still remains open. Now we move on to the next type of uh, non-authorized use licenses. That's government use and, un- and other unauthorized uses in India. Looking at government use, aside from compulsory licenses, as mentioned earlier, Article 31 also envisages non-volu- non-voluntary licenses in the form of government use licenses. In the Indian legislation, this is covered by Chapter 17. Uh, this includes Sections 99 to 103 and also in Section 47, which provides that in certain cases, the government can use a patented product without infringing upon the product. Chapter 17, which is titled Use of Inventions for the Purpose of Government and Acquisition of Inventions by the Central Government, allows the Central Government to use a patented invention for the purposes of the Central Government, State Government or Government Undertaking on terms of remuneration similar to that of compulsory licenses. Unlike compulsory licenses though, these provisions can be attracted even at the application stage rather than solely after the grant of the patent. Of course, even here the remuneration clauses remain the same. The government will be free to sell such licensed products on a non-commercial basis. Section 47.4, on the other hand, is a conceptual supplementary provision to Section 92A. Compulsory licenses, that is pharmaceutical products for export, permit the import of any patented medicine by the government for purposes merely of its own use or for distribution in any dispensary, hospital or other medical institution maintained by or on behalf of the government. Unlike other government use provisions though, this provision can be attracted only after the grant of the patent. The next type of non-voluntary license is the experimental use exception. The Indian patent regime makes use of flexibilities provided by Article 30 of the TRIPS agreement. By imp- implementing an experimental use exception, the regime allows third parties to fully understand and study products that have been granted patents, rendering a holistic satisfaction of the reason for the disclosure requirement. That is, that patent applicants must fully describe and disclose best methods of working of the patents that the applicant is seeking. Indian law is a broad interpretation of this experimentation provision as it not only allows any person to make use of the experimental exception for purposes of experimentation or research, but specifically includes the imparting of instruction to pupils within the exception. As this falls within the Article 30 requirement of not unreasonably prejudicing legitimate interests of the patentee and normal exploitation of the patent, this does not fall afoul of India's TRIPS obligations. Given that TRIPS aims to ramp up the technological capabilities of developing countries, this sort of a broad interpretation also furthers its object- objectives by encouraging the development of follow-on inventions and improvements, as well as encouraging the invention- inventing a round of patented inventions. And finally, we come to the last type of non-voluntary use license, that is the bowler exemption. As described earlier, Article 30 allows for the existence of bowler exceptions. This exception especially is relevant to the pharmaceutical field. It takes its name from the American case Roche Products versus Bolar Pharmaceuticals. Bolar Pharmaceuticals had successfully made the public policy argument that parties should be allowed to obtain information necessary to procure regulatory approval for a generic so that they could be ready to launch as soon as the patented drugs period expired. Section 107A provides for the exception in Indian law. This is especially relevant in India due to India's large generic pharmaceutical industry. It can be noted that the exception also allows exempt usage when information is sought to gain regulatory approval outside of the country. And with this we conclude our 
chapter on non-voluntary licenses. For a quick recap, we've seen that India uses a wide range of TRIPS flexibilities in a domestic law and of which compulsory licensing has garnered some of the most attention. The pharmaceutical and healthcare field is a best example. Because of the unique position that India finds itself in, India has to balance the concerns of a huge growing industry along with the access concerns of a largely poverty-stricken mass as well. As this chapter has shown in the area of non-voluntary licensing, where patent rights come in conflict with larger social concerns, India has carved out a well-thought-out and nuanced patent regime. Very briefly, stemming from Article 31 are Sections 84, and that is Patent Abuse, and Section 92, that is Public Interest Exceptions, as well as Government Use Exceptions, as under are Sections 99 to 103 and Section 47. Stemming from Article 30 of the TRIPS are tangential but still very relevant experimental use exceptions as well as the bowler exemptions. And with this, we conclude our chapter on compulsory licenses. Thank you.